Um, we're gonna, I'm going to ask Allison first, as the, as the project director for Keeping Families Together, to talk a little bit about what's that role? What, do you, what did you do? What did you feel was really important in, in working with um, the pilot and getting it up off the ground? Um, so, I realized I gave myself just a brief introduction. Can you hear me, by the way? Um, and uh, when we started, and not that I need a long one, um, but, but there are some new folks in the room, and so I should step back and say, as Nancy was talking about, um, and as you saw in the video, so um, back in 2007, CSH was funded by Robert Wood Johnson to um, implement a pilot project that would test the impact of supportive housing on high need child welfare involved families. And so um, our pilot um, was, as I said, just funded to do sort of a project um, development um, and uh, an evaluation. So we didn't have any money for housing or services. All of that sort of came through volunteers, um, like the folks from the panel, who were willing to share their supportive housing units with the pilot and be part of this initiative. Um, so I should say that first right off the bat, um, that you guys um, have a lot more of that sort of making connection between housing and services than we did. Um, we had that a little bit um, farther along, I think, in New York when we started. Um, but we still worked with five different city agencies um, and six different supportive housing providers to really um, get this going. Um, I would say that a couple of lessons I learned about getting it off the ground was um, uh, persistence and engagement. I think a lot of people thought I was a pain in the neck um, back during those days. Um, I think in terms of the city agencies, I think learning how to talk about supportive housing and learning how to talk about this initiative that appeals to other agencies is really important. Um, in New York, the child welfare system was really a new partner at the time in supportive housing. We really hadn't been involved at all. And so I think we struggled for three years of pilot to be able to really talk about how supportive housing could impact the child welfare system and how they could look at it as a way to serve their highest need families. Um, part of that was um, our own learning. Um, and part of that came out of our study because we saw who our families were. And we said, wow, this family didn't just meet their child welfare agency yesterday like we had thought. We thought it would be a preventive program. But actually, all of our families had years long histories in the child welfare system. And so that was an important piece um, to take with us as we started to talk about um, how supportive housing could um, start to decrease child welfare system involvement for the highest need families that keep coming back uh, to the system. So, Karen, yes. tell us about your role um, in terms of what you do and the families you serve and okay. get us started on that. Okay, so currently I am the Director of Supportive Housing at Lower East Side Service Center in New York. Um, I oversee four different programs. Um, two are congregate unit programs, one is a scattered site program, and one is, it is a congregate unit but it's currently in construction for supportive housing. Um, but before this position, I was at an agency called Women in Need, and when I first started there, I was a domestic violence counselor for the supportive housing units. We had about 40 scattered site units at the time, and I was promoted to program director, and within the next, I would say, three or four years, our scattered site program went from 50 units to over 200 units. So we really grew that program exponentially within that time frame. And uh, we had a lot of bumps in the roads, obviously, but we also were able to house a lot of families that were homeless. So it was a, a very worthwhile experience. I learned a ton. Um, and you know, I think right now, where we're at with the families, with supportive housing in New York City, for instance, where you know, we're still working on, even though we have opportunities for housing, we're still working on getting them out of the shelter system and placing them into, our, into the available units that are available. And then working with them from there, providing the necessary services and quality services that they need. So that's kind of where we're at. And could you just share something about some, uh, one or two of the families oh, yes. you've been working with? No. I have a woman. She was a felony history in 
federal penitentiary for 10 years, eight children. She lost custody of all of them. She came into our program. She couldn't get Section 8 because she had a felony record. She couldn't get night to housing because she had felonies. Mm -hmm. She came into our program. We got her two-bedroom apartment. She got her two kids back from the foster care system. They were of age, at the, uh, all the other ones were older. Worked at McDonald's as a manager. Changed her life around, got her associate's degree. She's still in her housing program at Women in Need nine years later. Wow. So, uh, right, the, op the opposites. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's really important to hear yeah. both um, sides of the story because it's, as you all know, um, or are beginning to learn, this is not easy. You are going to have successes and not so successes. Um, uh, and it's perseverance, I think somebody said. so. Emily, tell Hi. us about you and, and some of the families you've worked with. Um, so I'm the clinical coordinator at Palladia. Uh, Fox Point is our congregate housing, and I also oversee the clinical team for our scattered site as well. Um, at Fox Point, uh, we have 31 families who are New York, New York 3. So that means they have the chronically homeless piece along with the substance abuse. So our families, a lot of them um, came in uh, active, not necessarily engaged in treatment, um, so that was that was not a deterrent for us. Um, running the clinical team means that I oversee two case managers, so they both have a, one has a caseload of 15, the other 16. We also have a voc ed specialist on site and a child life specialist. I truly don't know that these families would be where they're at today without the services that they have in place. Uh, the only requirement that they have is to see their case manager once a month. So the child life specialist and the voc ed specialist are voluntary. Um, luckily, we outsource those two positions um, to the scattered site tenants as well. So uh, again, it's not, it's not required, um, but if they, if they weren't on site, I don't know where we'd be. So that's part of the services that we have. Um, a couple families that I, you know, I'm thinking of um, as we were, we're sitting here. When I when I first came on about three years ago, I remember the mother. We're only four years old as well, so the building opened up in 2009. Um, so the mother came in. She too had eight children, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. um, had been had done I believe 12 years in prison. Um, her kids luckily were able to stay with dad during that time, but she moved in with three of them. Three, um, two teenagers and one small child. And I, I'll never forget, she came into my office and she looked around and she said, oh, you're the clinical person? I'm the clinical. That's right. You don't have any pictures up here? You're not going to be here long either. So she already had, she read me, she, she knew what I was about, or so she thought. Um, not too long after that, I started the self-wellness program that, that Mary had designed. And she, was a part, she became a part of that group. Um, and she stuck with it throughout the nine weeks. Um, her, she had a very um, street mentality, I don't know how else to put it, where fighting was the way. Um, if, if something happened in school with one of her children, then she sought out the mother, because this is how we're going to handle this. We're going we're gonna to fight this out. So clinically, um, I you know, indirectly was able to work with her. Um, and it wasn't about coming weekly to see me. It was, why don't you stop in and, and vent your frustrations to me? So all the clinical terms were taken out of my vocabulary. Um, four years later now, uh, she starts work next week. And we are so excited because she has not worked a day in her life. Um, but she saw over the four years that I, I need to make a change. She, she's outgrowing supportive housing. And, and honestly, that's what we want. We want our tenants to outgrow us. Mm -hmm. they, they come in, I mean, and we say permanent, so it sounds confusing. I thought we're here for, forever, right? Um, and, if, and if they choose to be, some, some will. Some, some will be with us um, until, until their kids you know, move on. But others, such as herself, want, want to move to Pennsylvania and want to have a different life. And so, and so she's one of our successes right now. Um, an unfortunate story because that you know like Carrie said they don't all make it so to speak because another piece of this is paying their rent mm -hmm. and that's a very hard concept for a lot of our families time where some families just aren't ready um, and returning them to the shelter is, is an awful thing and it's unfortunate to see that truck pull up um, but we work with them until the very last second and we, we've 
unfortunately had a couple families that we had to we had to say goodbye to. Um, but ironically, they they call back. They want us to know, you know, that Miss Emily, I actually I got I got an apartment again, or I'm working, I have a job, and I think that's just a testament to what my team does and how hard they work. That a family that's been evicted will call back a month or two later to keep, to let us know what's going on. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's great. Mary, your turn. Tell us a little bit about what you do and how you work with uh, case managers and, and supervisors like Carrie and Emily. Terrific. So, so hi everyone. I'm Mary McKay, and I had the real privilege of being the clinical consultant during AFT, and and I just cannot even tell you how um, unbelievable the women are on this panel. I mean, if you haven't heard it already, you, you are, I had the real privilege of working in teams that were just dedicated to family success. And, and, and they were incredibly thoughtful and skillful around how did they provide support and services and some tough love and some real uh, kind of models that helped families be successful. It was amazing work. And so those of you that are about to embark on this journey, I'm making the immediate <coughs> assumption that you two are amazing. Um, you are going to be taking, you know, providing housing and integrated services for some of the families that have been on a very long, very hard journey. Um, and, and their persistence, their innovation around how you engage and motivate families, their ability to really um, kind of take advantage of what Family Supportive Housing has to offer, you have the really unique privilege of being embedded in where families live, in their communities, in their home. Um, you have the, the, the real privilege, although on any given day it can be a stressful privilege, of sitting in family's living room, seeing how the real struggles, and then trying to align what you have to provide with those real struggles. And, and so um, I, I think there's, there's an amazing opportunity in family supportive housing to in some ways redo families' experience with systems and services. So remember, services are voluntary in family supportive housing. And many of your families have had lots of prior system involvement. Some of those system involvement, that has been very coercive, highly negative, and you have a do-over in some ways as your families move in to really try to align felt needs for families with services. Um, it is not easy work. I, I've been, um, I come from a, a clinical background. I, I provided services to urban kids and families for, I'm the oldest one on the panel, so for a lot of decades. <laughs> and, um, and seasons. seasons. <laughs> I, and, but I think this is some of the most complicated work I've ever seen. And, and, and I think that that's, it's cross systems, as Allison said. But it's also how do you um, create kind of a strength-based, normative kind of set of supports around a family, irrespective of the histories that these guys just talked about. Um, how do you kind of provide services in ways that allow for people to make mistakes? The, the woman that, that Emily is talking about, um, how, how do you help her recover from a fist fight on the elevated train? Um, you know, how do you help her to kind of really heal in a way that, that aligns services with her, her language that she can really accept? It's some of the most rewarding work, and, um, and I just I feel so connected to this panel. And I think that, that you'll feel that way across sites and within your own teams, because you're bonded by the toughness of the work, and you're also incredibly uplifted by the rewards. Mm -hmm.